edition of the Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful podcast. This is part of our Our Future, Our Voice NI series, leading the conversation for COP26. In this episode, we're going to be focusing on the world of clean technologies. We're going to be looking at some of the big innovations that are happening out there in the lead up to the COP26 conference. And to talk to us about this, we have got an absolute gem of an expert. We have Ian Percy from Artemis Technologies based here locally. Ian, you are very welcome to the Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful podcast. Thank you, David. Happy to be here. Um, Ian, I just want to start off with um, the potential. As when I was doing my research for this, the potential of these of 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 green technologies, the, the potential of, of what you work in, uh, in particular. I mean, how great is it? Because it seems like it's a very exciting time to be involved in this sector and in this industry. Yeah, I think I think Artemis Technologies is is focused on maritime. It's focusing on green transportation, people, high speed maritime transportation and in that sector um it's 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 a transformative technology that artemis technologies is bringing on the ability to reduce fuel costs um which is something we'll come back to for operators by up to 80 percent but importantly also remove the emissions at source on the vessel so i think i guess the more wider point is that's representative of i believe many green technologies where in the long run it's also economically sustainable as well as environmentally sustainable and certainly it's something that i think offers a lot of opportunities it offers um an opportunity to make changes that aren't at the expense and it's something we hear about a lot in the news um yeah but how do we afford this new green technology or the costs of the transition and there are costs but the costs are short term in the long run regardless of the vital environmental benefits there's also economic benefits and also what so why is this so important because everyone seems to be talking about i mean maybe it is just with the rising cost of energy maybe it is just cop 26 being uh being uh, uh being ongoing and around the corner i mean why is this so important for for the planet why is this so important for you know kind of the the economic uh, baseline as well i mean i think the environmental challenges is, is you know almost universally accepted to be an existential threat on the planet and therefore on our species i think it's you know my personal belief is the human race wouldn't get wiped out but it would be a pretty horrendous few hundred years and there would be um be a lot of suffering for a lot of people and a lot of um other animals and i think it's getting pretty close to the point where that's going to happen anyway uh, not you know i think it's about degree and i think everyone needs to make changes you know vital vital changes and very very fast for the environment but you know and i think it is right to stress that the fact that this is also good economic sense in some cases some other aspects will just be a straight cost if we can find carbon capture technology let's hope we can these kind of things will just be straight paying money to um in terms of human resource wind resource to extract it something like that which would be a fantastic development yeah that's just the cost of undoing the mess but there's a lot of opportunities around reducing the damage the additional damage on a on an annual basis of our humans activity that doesn't need to be seen in that way it can be seen in um, economic opportunity jobs opportunity so i think it's a balance i don't think we need to i don't think it's right to kid ourselves that there's always these golden tickets but when we find one which we believe artemis technologies offers in the maritime sector we need to embrace it Mm-hmm. I know. I, th- I mean, you, you've led me on very nicely there to our next question. I, I was when I was doing research for uh, for this podcast. I've been looking at some of the things that you guys have been working on, and my goodness, I, I didn't realize. I mean, even from from kind of a lay a lay person on, on this, I didn't realize how far advanced some of these technologies are. I didn't realize kind of how how developed you know some some of these approaches are. So, could could you tell us a wee bit about? some of the things that you're working on and kind of the the potential that that is there. Yeah. So absolutely the, the basis of our technology to give people the background is that when a boat flies effectively so this is like your normal aircraft wings but underwater when a boat uses them to take the boat out of the water when you're going fast and by fast I mean 20 miles an hour plus once you're going fast there's a dramatic reduction in drag 
um, for vessels, not for tankers. I think it's important to note this is for a weight range, it's for a size range. It's, it's actually, for those who are interested in the physics, it's a weight to wingspan relationship, but a super tank would need wings you know, about the, the width of uh, the island here. So um, it would be unviable. But in a, a it, it flies these boats above the water, medium sized, fast ferries for passengers, offshore wind, it flies above the water, it dramatically reduces the drag. And that does a number of things. One, it reduces costs. You knew it would reduce costs if you were a diesel operator. But what it does most importantly is increase the range for a zero emissions operation significantly. It gives the opportunity to go twice as far on zero emissions technology. And that's quite important when you're at sea because there's not that many opportunities to plug in when you're in the middle of the ocean or when you're on the way to a wind farm. Um, by its nature, the uh, the pressure that I feel in my electric car when I'm getting a little bit low is significantly worse for the seafarers when they're at sea. So range is really, really important. And it's been the barrier for adoption um, of zero emissions technology at sea is concerns about range, um, certainly in the high speed um, area. And so, yes, this technology is advanced. And the reason is it's coming, it's bringing together existing technologies and packaging them together. Some of those technologies, Artemis techno technologies was part of developing hydrofoiling. Hydrofoiling was part of our racing heritage with the America's Cup where mm -hmm. um, we discovered through trying to win races that if you take off out the water, you go a lot faster. Mm -hmm. um, so that technology was developed in a racing environment. Electric engines, that's something that, has obviously been advancing in automotive for a number of years now. You know, the BMWs and Teslas of this world and, and, and major OEMs have been developing electric tech engine technology. And now we've got to a point where in the automotive world, it's starting to get to a wash over the lifetime of a vessel between the upfront costs. And, the, and that's thanks to them, there's been a lot of development. So technologies are advanced. Battery technology, well documented, improving mm -hmm. all the time in power density. So the technologies have been improving and really Artemis technology is bringing them together, some of which are proprietary to us, the hydrofoiling and the control modules that may allow us to can fly safely in bumpy seas, but some of which have come from other industries and you bring them together. So yes, the technology is mature, the results and the simulation of the potential before we even started this venture, we had immense confidence in. And mm -hmm. so we, you know, we, we, we knew that this was going to be technologically possible and economically sustainable before we started the venture. So uh, that was something that gave us a lot of confidence. This isn't a, uh, you know, a long, although a big technological jump, it's not a, uh, a run in blindly into the horizon either. Yeah, and it's it's been spreading across. Of course, I mean, you, I know I know your focus is the maritime, but we've now seen me, for example, Translink, for example, uh, are buying into to to many green technologies. We're seeing we're seeing other public transport providers buying into this. We're seeing lots of car companies uh, uh, buying into this as well. What have you made of the spread of of basically the, the the rush for these green technologies? I mean, what 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 have you made of how of how quickly that has happened? Well, I think it's public opinion first and foremost, which is which is really reassuring because it means that when people in the world realise that the next generations don't need to inherit our problems, people are willing to look at it. But it's coupled with it making economic sense. Now, it's it's getting a lot close, as I said, with with cars, it's getting close. So uh, for sure, the early adopters are the people who are privileged enough to be able to afford that. That is inevitably the case with some of this stuff. But in the long run, the economics gets to a point where it makes sense for everyone. Often a financing problem, which we'll come back to in the future, it's upfront cost versus operating cost. But I think for all these technologies, that model is reasonably similar. There's a public opinion that wants to do it. There's an upfront capex cost to make a change. And then there's generally lower operating costs. Um, you know, these technologies are efficient, electric, propulsion however the power source is stored be batteries or hydrogen the actual engine the mgus are efficient you know compared to combustion engines so there's real there's kind of inherent advantages on the operating cost for those efficiencies and that, i think that's pretty much across the board and it's actually not much different to wind farms and yeah. solar farms that we've seen over the last 20 years that there is an upfront cost you know they don't get it back on day one it's a um, it's a project finance exercise it's a understanding the returns and i think I think the complication with transportation 
is that they're often different people that are operating than they are making um, or they don't own or the owner of the asset is often different than. so i think there, there's some complications there about financing and i think that's a that's a kind of governmental private banking sector challenges how do we offer finance and there's often technical risk as well with new technologies mm -hmm. that, that offer offer challenges you know but no different than it did early days in wind farms it's just now it's a tried and tested model they know the returns are going to be and they are willing to fund the upfront investment so i think it's a well-trodden path and i think that you know so i think that's great from a um, and i can see why economically it will roll out but it has to be led by public opinion someone ultimately wants has to want to do this you know mm -hmm. when we provide a um pilot ferry coming into belfast city center people need to want to get on that they need to want to get it because it gets them to work quicker they need to want to do it because they care that it will have less emissions for their city mm -hmm. locally and for the wider planet so public opinion is important and uh, you know there's no doubt that that is a rising um swell of recognition of the challenge we face yeah and uh, interesting i um i saw i mean you, you you've been talking about you know kind of the the, the opportunities that are out there i mean th there are there are a lot of because we're all talking about you know building back better from the pandemic and we're talking about building a better economy and and you know a more a more diverse job market i mean there are a lot of jobs in this, aren't there? I mean, the the, the potential for for green jobs and those uh, in in this sector are are huge, aren't they? Yeah, there is, and and you know, in some ways, um, Europe has compared to the US or China missed the tech explosion around software. You know, it's I think um, we were slow to react there, and I think because of the social attitudes changing fast in. Northern Europe or Europe in general, I think that's created a faster movement here towards green technology, which right now for the next five, 10 years will give region Europe an advantage. It will give us the possibility to lead in green technologies, which eventually will need to be adopted everywhere. So it offers a lot of opportunity. I think I think when, when I always talk about anchoring jobs, something that's important to me is that those jobs are high value jobs. And I think green tech again, as a part to play there, but only some areas. And I think what I always see, ultimately this comes down to the cost derivatives of the product that you're developing. If there, it's a race to the bottom on cost, there's not much complexity, it's not many barriers to entry, tends to not anchor real high value jobs. If the technology involved is quite complicated, has high capex costs, once you're in, it's not worth it for anyone else, should we say then those jobs can demand a high, high margin or the products can and therefore the labor can and it can reward well-paid jobs um you know at to create a standard of living in europe which is obviously more expensive than other parts of the world that is fair and and sustainable on from a social aspect so i think it is important always to try and look at the kind of jobs we're creating and i think they they are a outcome of the kind of technologies that we're creating and essentially the complexity and barriers to entry that those technologies have or do not have mm -hmm. and you were talking about upfront cost there you're talking about kind of some of the some of the challenges there i mean what could what can policymakers do uh not just locally but nationally as well and internationally um for for, for that matter what can they do to support this industry and what can they do to to accelerate and remove any barriers that exist out there? I think, David, your point uh, international is really, really important because some industries, by the nature and maritime is one, aerospace being another, that involve travel and international travel mean that it's very difficult if you don't have international cooperation. I mean, I, I know of people who have large boats, you know, back in the day when I didn't find that too offensive who would um, who would get who would have their boat based in miami and they would literally go to venezuela to put 600 grand worth of fuel into it to come back again and you know that's just a clear example that you um you um you really can't just focus on your own country and think in some industries you're going to make a difference that said our vessels artemis technologies are high speed um domestic transportation and so it really does offer opportunities to have leadership on the regulatory environment by countries that adopt our technology and i think it you know there's there's many ways government need to help you know and i think regulation is one i.e um 
ultra low emission zone would be a classic in cities and that can be extended in the maritime sector to certain regions be they wind farms or offshore aquaculture farms need to be zero emission so there's an opportunity for regulation there's an opposite opportunity through taxation and subsidy to nudge you know you would it would be amazing for people to hear that for those of us who've who over the years have filled up at the, the pumps with our cars that there is no taxation on maritime diesel so maritime people are paying no cost for the social and environmental cost of their diesel right now on the water it's shocking mm-hmm. it's, it's absolutely shocking it's subsidized effectively so um there's 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 taxation and the, and subsidy if you take the norwegian model right now you get um one euro per nautical mile per litre of diesel saved on certain routes. It's pretty simple, pretty straight. It's a subsidy paid for by taxation on the marine diesel. So there's 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 economic impact. And I think maybe an opportunity for an advanced banking sector like we have um, you know, in the UK, I think there's offered opportunities to do risk sharing between government um, for financing high capex projects for um, parts of the world that wouldn't necessarily have the opportunity to deliver that, be it um, traditionally an export finance type model. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that's quite interesting because it's a unique strength that we have where we can partner with private and public funding, where the public is taking on some of the risk of privates providing the capital to roll out large CapEx projects. And I think that the opportunity there is to offer longer terms to reflect the fact that these products, be they trains or, mm-hmm. or, um, or, or electric vessels or hydrogen vessels or whatever they are, that they, they the green solutions often are a longer payback time. And that's where there's an opportunity if we're inventive with governments working in partnership with private sector, we can lead in the, mm-hmm. in the financing of, of a green transition, which is also going to be a huge market along with the technologies themselves. Mm-hmm. And obviously we're on the cusp of COP26, where you know some of the most uh, influential people in the world are coming together um, to talk um, about climate, about the climate emergency, and about how we can, about how we can best tackle it. What is it that you hope to see from COP26? I mean, what, what, what would you like to be reading in your paper or seeing online on on news sites um, in the days, weeks, and months after COP26? Well, I think there's the general hope that there's seen to be a coming together of governments that we have to tackle this together um i hope that that accelerates over the the coming weeks because i think that's you know i do believe that's important because we we have this fundamental challenge that if people are always going to take the short-term view the short-term advantage for their nation classically talking about coal um coal electricity generation if you if you're just going to keep your country's costs down and keep competitive advantage for the next few years next in a few years time it'll be another way we're going to do that and it's a race to the bond so there needs to be this kind of you know we've always worked with national laws and that doesn't really work with the climate so there needs to be as a as an as an as a individual i want to see that general acceptance that we do need to work together which we tend to see whether we tend to see follow-up or not i don't know but we tend to see at these climate conference from a specific to artemis technology standpoint i'd like to see um, work happening in our sector in transportation particularly you know domestic high-speed transportation which you know is it is you know it's, it's it's where we're putting our efforts but it's also a huge contributor one third of maritime pollution comes from domestic so it's a really and 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 maritime is well documented is a large contributor to the worldwide greenhouse gas emission so it's a it's a big area from an environmental standpoint but from an area that we're working on it's obviously something that we're most interested in and seeing that um, commitment for nations to produce green infrastructure is really important it's part of a connected city vision um, and our and our vessels have a part to play, obviously in water locked cities, um, particularly they have a part to play in that. But it, it is only a part because you have to see the connectivity um, as part of the infrastructure, both people, transportation, joining up aspects, but also charging. Mm-hmm. In this case, 
or hydrogen bunkering in the future, we, it has to be part of an overall solution. So I want to see that. I want to see countries committing sums to transforming their people transportation networks, transforming their crew transfer to wind farm networks. I want to see more adoption of wind because that's an application for our product that's really, really applicable. So I think, I think, yeah, there, there, so there's the two things for me out of COP. I want to see general worldwide cooperation or we're all in real trouble. Um, but, and, I, and, and from a Artemis technology standpoint and a, a commitment to invest in green infrastructure around the world. Are you optimistic that that could happen? I'm optimistic there'll be warm words about cooperation and I don't think they should be poo-pooed too much. I think if we're not doing that, we're in real trouble. So we mm. do need that. That's the start. I think it's just, as I say, I think the challenge that we have is we haven't got many mechanisms that are truly international and have many teeth behind them. So it's pretty difficult. Um, if we if we were a solar system planet and the earth was one country and one and one set of laws, it would be a lot easier. Uh, unfortunately, you know, that's not the way our planet is made up. We haven't got a planet government and a planet set of rules. And so, you know, international cooperation is the best we have. Climate conferences like COP is the best we have, but we're fighting against a structure that isn't necessarily um, optimized for this kind of global action. So, look, am I confident? I think it's going to be small steps. Let's hope they it gathers pace. I think every time we see genuine disasters from uh, from extreme climate events, like we're seeing more and more, I think they're the things I think touch people because they're a little bit of a forebearer of what we will see in a hundred years. So I think that's quite, it's very horrible, but I think that does sharpen minds. And when the costs of that start to get quite extreme, even though it's a drop in the ocean, what it would be, if we saw three, four degrees of warming, but it's, it's it's a it's it scares people into action and it scares companies into action and governments because ultimately they end up starting to have to pay um so i you know i th sadly it'll probably be it'll probably have to get worse before it gets better but you know public opinions driving it technology i believe in public opinion moving i believe in technology looking for economic opportunities uh, driven i do believe by um altruistic um companies that want to make change but see they can do it economically sustainable too there's a lot of other things a lot of people who work for me could be doing and they're choosing to do this for less money because they care about it so it's almost proof in the pudding i see that every day i go to work so i think there are companies and individuals who are changing and willing to invest their their sweat into this so i think that side i have confidence in i think the regulatory side i think will we're going to end up being led by areas of domestic change that can have local advantage domestically and therefore are adopted. Eventually, I'd love to see organizations like the IMO and the International Maritime Organization having enough teeth to make real changes and real roadmaps that people have to follow. Um, and the same with the aircraft industry. So, I, I, you know, they are the organizations we need to give weight to. We need internationalism is important when we're talking about our one world. Yeah, internationalism is important, absolutely, and that's a great note to end on. Ian, thank you for being so generous with your time uh, this morning, and uh, this has been us speaking to Ian Percy from Artemis Technologies. If you want to comment on anything Ian has said, please make sure you use the hashtag our future, our voice, and I. That's all we have time for in this episode, and just leaves me to say thank you again to our guest, Ian Percy. Thank you, David. Thank you for listening to the Keep Northern Beautiful podcast. Please make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can be reminded of future episodes.